Let's take our Bibles and turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and begin there tonight. Um, let me say thank you as well for the opportunity, uh, Pastor Randall, to be able to preach at all of these um, these evenings and uh, the different locations, and very grateful for that, and for the ones that were saved, and um, the praise the Lord for that, and uh, so we're very, very grateful for all these things, and yes, I am excited about seeing my family, and so at least my wife and my youngest uh, tomorrow, so we'll meet together in Bloomington, Normal, uh, Illinois, and then uh, I'll preach at a church just on Sunday, and then we travel on Monday up to the Chicagoland area, and I'll do some video work as far as getting some uh, videos done for Salvation uh, presentations there. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Then being Rockford, Illinois, and then maybe one other place. And then that's going to be about it for the year for us. We're wrapping things down. Uh, usually December, we're down in Tennessee and um, finished for the year. Uh, a lot of times evangelists are not necessary apparently in church's schedules in December uh, so but it is good for us to be able to have that downtime we're looking forward to uh, all of that as well uh, Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to begin and um, look if you would at verse 15 and 16 the Bible says this so as much as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Notice in verse 15 that phrase, I am ready. The title of the message tonight is I am ready. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I ask that you would do your work and Lord, quicken us and Lord, revive us. Lord, help us to truly experience um, not only your help and effectiveness in uh, witnessing, but in every aspect of our life, Lord, would you help us and revive us, Lord, revive this church here, and Lord, I pray that you'd help in the future, and certainly those that have been saved to be baptized and added into the church as well, and they just continue to grow, and Lord, I pray that you would have your way tonight, fill me with your spirit, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In college, I asked the Lord to give me a friend that loved God and loved souls and wanted to go out and be a, a witness, and God gave me a, uh, that friend. He was a six-foot-three Idaho farm boy, and he was everything I was. Um, he was, uh, I was always, you know, let's think about it, let's plan it out and organize it. He was, let's do it first and think about it later, you know, that type of guy. And he said, hey, Chris, you want to go with me on an outreach on a Friday night? And uh, I said, sure. I said, it's downtown. And just a group of us guys go down there. We just witness and talk about dark. It, it was really dark then. And he said, uh, we go down there. Well, when they organized it, and it was from, you know, organized from the college. And so they needed to have some rules. And they said, okay, first rule is you stay on this main drag. Uh, you know, they gave some other things and just some other su suggestions as well. They said, make sure you don't carry money with you. <laughs> it's kind of a nice neighborhood. And uh, no, it wasn't. And uh, so they said, be careful not to carry any cash with you. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a little bit of a uh, questionable area. So make sure you're careful there. And so anyway, we started, we weren't there on the main drag five minutes where it was all lit nicely. You know, you could see everything just fine. And my friend said, hey, Chris. I got a place for us to go. <laughs> I said, aren't we supposed to stay there? <laughs> you know? So we started heading uh, on to the, um, uh, off to the side roads and it was just dark. And talk about tonight, you know, it, we, we actually had a, a pretty good neighbor at every single door. Somebody was there, it was quite amazing. Uh, but uh, we're knocking on doors and it's so dark. I mean, there's no porch lights, there's nothing on some whatever and uh, nobody's answering it's like go away <laughs> it's a it's a bad neighborhood and they weren't used to opening the door certainly at night let alone probably even during the day and uh, so anyway so we're walking along we can't find anybody to witness to and uh, so we keep going and it's like getting darker and darker but we come to this one intersection and and you, the whole intersection was dark except for one corner and this one corner had just one establishment on it, one store. I don't know if it was a liquor store, but it kind of looked that way with bars on the doors, bars on the windows, and it had uh, an overhang over the single door that just entered at the corner and it had one incandescent light bulb just hanging there. 
<laughs> kind of get the idea. And uh, so um, we're walking around the corner. And as we're walking around the corner, two guys come around. And uh, I'm just a little startled. Didn't startle my friend at all. And we start talking to them and start getting the gospel. Well, in the conversation, they want some cash. They want some money. I had forgotten that I actually had some money with me. And, and I'm like, oh, man, I forgot I, I had that on me. And uh, so I'm just staying quiet. And my friend says, hey, uh, man, I'm so sorry. I don't have any money. He looks at me. He says, Chris, do you have any money? <laughs> I had the temptation to lie, but I didn't. I said, uh, yes, I do. He said, I'll pay you back. I knew he'd be good for it. So he goes ahead and he uh, takes the money from me and he hands it to the guys. And then they stayed there for 45 minutes to be able to hear the gospel message. No, they didn't. What did they do? <laughs> they took off. All they wanted was the money. Well, as they took off, they start going. And uh, this whole time, someone had been in the dark watching us in a car across the street. And some headlights come on and the car drives over towards us. And there's some other lights on the car on top of the car. And those lights came on as well. And uh, so one officer ran over to us, said, hold it right there. Another officer ran over to the other guy, said, freeze. You know? And they thought we were doing drugs. We said, no, we're just telling them about Jesus. You know? my t I tell you, my friend was always ready to give the gospel. I remember being down and uh, we actually went to a trip uh, to Caracas, Venezuela. And we did some street preaching and different things down there. Just incredible um, friend. He's in heaven now. And unfortunately, um, the Lord took him home a little early. But, uh, you know, the truth is he was ready to give the gospel. And he was such an encouragement to me in that area. You know, God is waiting for us to be ready to win souls. You know, I think in any effective gospel witness, there needs to be four elements that need to be ready. And I want to like look at these and really focus in, obviously, and the fact that we need to be ready. Look at Romans 1 15. It says this. So as much as in me is, I am ready, but to do what? To preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Then it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, there's another passage of scripture as well that talks about the power of the gospel. Let's mention the four things that need to be ready for the gospel to be a powerful and effective and a gospel witness, that is. Number one, the gospel is ready. Let's just put, put it down that way. The gospel is ready right now without anything that we have to do to add to it. We don't have to enhance it. We don't have to do anything. The gospel by itself is powerful. It is dynamite in power, and it's effective. You say, well, I don't, you know, sometimes I witness, and I don't feel like uh, I have a powerful witness, or I don't feel like there's much to it. Well, again, it's not in our presentation. It's not in the way I say something. Uh, yes, I need to be clear. Yes, I need to give the gospel. Yes, I need to use God's word. But the reality is this. It is powerfully dynamized. That dunamis is the idea. Power. It's dynamite. Now, if I took some dynamite tonight and I lit it, would I get your attention? Yeah, I think so. And then if I lit it and then I handed it to you, <laughs> I say, here, what would you do? You'd want to pass it on to someone else. <laughs> and you would notice right away, I've got something powerful in my hands. Folks, the gospel is that powerful, effective thing without you, without me. You know, there's, um, unfortunately, throughout the years, I've heard different evangelists, different preachers and such, and they try to do uh, psychology or use some type of way to trick people <laughs> listening to or even making a decision to trust Christ. Don't do that. Simply trust God and that the power of the gospel is enough to be able to save, save someone. I remember one uh, particular evangelist, he said, I used to sell vacuum cleaners. And when I would go to the door, I would uh, knock on the door and I'd say, I, I'm just going to take just a few minutes of your time. And uh, I'd like to just to show you, you some things. And he starts doing this. So he said, what we would do is we would tap our watch. You always have to tap your watch, he said, and, which I have none. And, uh, and, and then uh, you'd rub your feet because if you're going to sell vacuum cleaners to a lady, you know, you want her to realize that, you know, you're being you know, careful and, and everything. You're rubbing your feet on the doormat, so you're ready to come in the door. So it's all psychological. 
And so he's like, okay. So what we would do is we'd say, okay, I just need a few minutes of your time to give the gospel. And could you imagine? Okay, everyone, let's stand up. Let's practice, all right? All right. That's silly, isn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tactic. It's, a, it's taking something from the world and sales and such and saying, okay, well, this is what we need to do to make the gospel effective or powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, law, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Not only do we feel the effectiveness of the power of God, but we see that effectiveness as we're handing out that dynamite and we're giving it to someone else. But I'm not depending upon the wisdom of of words. The gospel is the death, the burial of Jesus Christ for our sins according to the scriptures, and that is the good news message. And it's because we are sinners and our sin has separated us from God, and we need to depend upon Jesus and Him alone. That gospel message is a powerful message. You know what? The gospel is ready right now, isn't it? Okay, what's the second element that needs to be ready? I believe it's the lost. Can we mark that down? The lost. Uh, are ready. The lost are ready. That is, the unsaved are ready. Uh, look at John chapter 4. Uh, John chapter 4 um, and verse 35. John chapter 4, find verse 35. The Bible says here in John chapter 4, verse 35, it says, Jesus saith unto them, um, I'm sorry, verse 34, there's verse 35. Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, uh, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, I was a city boy, and so I didn't know my, what it meant to be white already to harvest, but the idea certainly is not only is it harvest time, but it's ready to be picked right now, right this moment, that there are people ready to be saved. There are people right now I remember in central Illinois years ago, or maybe it was northern, I can't remember, um, and I stayed at a hog farmer's house, <laughs> but he also had, um, he had some crops, and so, um, so we were sitting there, it's September, and they were already starting some early harvesting of just some of the outside, some of the perimeter of the field, but they're really waiting just a couple more days, or maybe a week or so, and they're going to just hit it hard and um, get the main harvesting. And said, so, you know, when we start doing that, it's just nonstop. It's, you're eating in the tractors and you're just going and uh, all the time and very little sleep and all of this. And could you imagine, I'm sitting at the, the um, farmer's table. I could look out his window and I could see the corn. He never did say, you know what, four months, we'll start that harvesting process. <laughs> no. Four months, and the harvest would be obviously lost at that point. Throughout the Word of God, we see not only fields that are describing people, but we see harvest. Why is that? Because we need to see this fact and this truth that there, is, there are people right now ready to be saved, and it's the harvest of souls. Matthew chapter 9 talks about it. Matthew chapter 9, if you're able to. Uh, turn there, Matthew chapter 9. In the latter part of verse, uh, latter part of the chapter, of course, Jesus here is teaching in the synagogues. He's preaching. He's moved with compassion in verse 36, um, because they're like sheep that have no shepherd. In verse 37, Matthew 9, 37, then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He didn't, see, didn't say fields one time. He's talking about the harvest. Why? Because the, the truth of the white harvest, or people are ready to be saved, is what Jesus was wanting to say. When I first saw this, and of course the command here is to pray, right? Pray for laborers. By the way, I pray for laborers every day. And the, typically, it is, if, it's, if it's not, it's very unique. But the very first thing, and I write down my prayer list every day. Um, I write down the first thing. <laughs> laborers. Yes, um, there need to be more evangelists, full-time evangelists. There need to be more pastors. I tell you, I know more pastors. I'm, I know more churches that are needing pastors than I know pastors looking for churches. 
Um, there needs to be more missionaries. But folks, laborers just simply people that are working and harvesting and lay folks that are willing to be all in with the gospel. When I, when I first was reading this years ago and, you know, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, I kind of, I'm a visual person, so I kind of see things. I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of looking like a drone shot. You know, here's a farmer, and uh, it's a farmer, and he's standing in his field, and there's dirt all around, and it needs to be plowed up, and there's weeds and some grass or whatever. But, uh, you know, he just needs to be all worked and everything. And this, the, the drone just kind of goes out, and he's, you see this massive field, and the farmer's praying to God, say, God, send me some laborers. That's not the idea. It's not that he's in a field that needs to be worked and seeded and sown and watered. It's already done all that. He's in a field that's corn that's probably as high as he is. And the only way we could see him is from a drone perspective. And just imagine it going larger and larger. You see so many hundreds and even thousands of acres. And he has his hands lifted to heaven and he says, Dear God, just send me some laborers. If they come, they'll be able to pick a harvest they'll be able to bring back sheaves <laughs> they'll be able to bring bushels of uh, of harvest that's the idea as we need to realize that there are people ready to be saved now sometimes you say well yeah well that's not the case um the reality is this there are people ready to be saved because the bible says so and that there is a harvest out there and there are ones that are searching and looking and are wondering and are even perhaps praying uh, that God would send somebody to help them. The harvest uh, is ready. That is the lost are ready. The gospel is ready. L number three, the Holy Spirit is ready. The Holy Spirit is ready. You know, we saw in Acts chapter one um, uh, there that you shall receive power. Would you look back at that passage again? And I know there's some overlap with some of the messages and truths, but I think it's good for us to, to be reinforced with some of these things. Look at Acts chapter 1 and look at again at verse 8, Acts 1. And I want to really focus in on one particular word here. In Acts 1, 8, the Bible says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Okay, so it is receive. Now, oftentimes we'll say, okay, uh, when we're describing the gift of salvation, and uh, here is a gift, and we say, okay, uh, God is offering you a gift just like anyone else is offering a gift. Okay, if a gift was here and I had it here, maybe you said it there, what would you have to do to receive it? Yeah, we'd say, okay. Then the, we'd have the person, and they typically would say what? All you have to do is? You know, that word receive here means take. So oftentimes we think this, we think receive power. Well, I'm just going to sit back and um, wait until God zaps me with power. Kind of like a jellyfish that just kind of goes with the current wherever it goes or whatever, just kind of floating around. No, no, no. It is, but ye shall receive, ye shall take, not, we're not taking uh, um, apart from what God wants. We're not taking uh, in uh, opposition to his will, but we're taking by faith. It is saying, dear God, I take the power of the Holy Spirit and your effectiveness in a do not have on my own. I can't do this. Uh, and the, the Holy Spirit's ready to empower you. Are you ready to take by faith what he's offering? But not only that, of course, to lead us and to direct us in, in our past. And in Acts chapter 8 and throughout the different passages of Scripture, we see Philip, he's led of the Spirit uh, to go to the Gaza Strip, and, and he's directed there. And the Holy Spirit can lead us. The Holy Spirit is ready not only to empower us, but to lead us. So as we look at this, we see, yes, to have an effective witness in any time, we need to have the gospel. It's already ready. <laughs> the lost. The harvest is ready. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ready both to empower us and to also lead us and direct us upon our path. But number four is you must be ready. <laughs> is you must be ready. And Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel. You know, he's ready to be imprisoned. It's incredible. He's ready to get on a boat. 
he was ready to go through all that shipwreck. And he believed God that God was going to take him uh, there to be able to give the gospel. What an incredible thing. We must be ready. Okay, so how is it that we need to be ready? Now, last night we talked a little bit about the matter of Luke chapter 11. And we're praying and, and the disciples gave up in prayer. And But why is it that God would ask us or want us to continue to ask for the power and the effectiveness and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We said, well, is God mean? Well, obviously not. Is he reluctant? No, he is not. He's not hesitant in any way. So we see this is that God is waiting for us to be ready, ready to be empty of self, ready to be um, to, to, uh, to confess that sin and, and get uh, less of the world and more of the affection and the filling of the Holy Spirit. But tonight as we look at this can we just say those words i am ready well according to the book of acts how could some in here say that they were ready look at acts chapter 6 if you would acts chapter 6 find verse 7 uh, in fact um <laughs> uh, look at acts chapter 6 find verse 5 and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Skip down, if you would, to verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, verse 8, full of faith, and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Let's stop right there. What is Stephen here doing? What do we see? We see that he is full of faith. He is full of power. And as a result, would you allow me to continue and say he's full of obedience? So there's three things for us to be ready, as even Stephen here was, to be full of faith, full of power, full of obedience. Now, whenever it mentioned is interesting, is it not? In verse 8, it says, in Stephen, full of faith and power. But in verse 5, how does it describe? Full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is going on? Well, let's, first of all, let's deal with this um, matter of full of faith. Full of faith is just simply depending upon God, taking God at his word. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How is it that we know and understand that the worlds are framed? By the word of God. And we just simply take the fact that God created all of what we see in creation. Okay, now if God could speak and all of this is created, folks, what can God not do? You know, when he speaks and he gives us his word, is it true? Yes. Is it trustworthy? Yes. Every promise, every time, yes, it is. And we need to have this matter of just simply being full of faith for our prayer life, but also in a witness like we ought to, saying, okay, dear God, I believe that the gospel is powerful enough without me adding anything to it. I believe that the, there are people ready to be saved, that there is a harvest out there. And I believe the Holy Spirit, you can lead me to them and you can empower me to be able to see that person saved. And I believe that, well, we need to have that and we need to be full of faith in that way. You know, there's, um, there's nothing worse than going out soul winning and you don't think anything's gonna happen. <laughs> and you're going because Everybody else is going. I don't really feel like going tonight, but you know. Ever go through that struggle? Or is that, am I the only human up here? Okay. Um, yeah, ever feel like, oh boy. I used to go, and it used to be such a, a drudgery um, because I was going for b flesh dependency, but also for man's motives. To say I went, or to say this is how many we people we got saved and I gotta I gotta push for a decision I gotta force even when the the door's not open or the person's not truly that they're not receptive and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing because I want to say how many people trusted Jesus Christ as Savior that was totally wrong isn't it no wonder it became a drudgery 
um, I would go as a guilt trip, and boy, I felt bad. And yeah, I do want wanted people to be saved, but when I started to see these truths, that the gospel's ready and is powerfully effective, the harvest is ready, there are people ready to be saved right now, the Holy Spirit's ready, He'll lead you to them, He'll empower you. The pressure was off as I just simply took God at His word, and I just trusted Him. I mean, can I say this? And I, I, I certainly don't want to, again, make it sound like it's man-centered, but soul winning became easy. Not because I was doing it, or I had a polished presentation, or I just learned something. This is how you do this. It's because of now my whole dependency changed. My whole focus changed. It was off of me in a man-centered um, presentation to try to do something for man's glory. And I was saying, dear God, this is all for you, and I'm just taking you at your word. I was reading this morning, Jeremiah 32. Behold, God, is there anything that's too hard for thee? Thou hast made the heavens and the earth. By thy straight, stretched out arm and by thy power. And I misquoted some of that, but the truth is and the reality is, God, there is nothing too hard for thee. And the Lord says that back to Jeremiah why is that? Because he had some questions and he said, he said, behold, there is nothing too hard for me. Would we just simply take God at his word? One particular uh, church we're at, he said, okay, we're going to do uh, this um, going into revival services and evangelistic services. We're going to do it a little differently. We're going to do it like the book of Acts. I thought, well, that's kind of a good idea. <laughs> we should do something like the Bible. And, uh, and they said, okay, you know, they, here they are. They, they prayed in the upper room. We talked about that last night. For 10 days, they waited. He said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to wait and we're going to pray for 10 days. We're not going to do any soul winning. We're not going to take the bus out. We're not going to um, go out witnessing. But for 10 days, we're going to have prayer meetings. There'll be a prayer meeting at the church at more, in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. Just pick which one that would work with your schedule. If you can come to more than one, then come. So for 10 days, they had prayer meetings like that. <laughs> and then, he said, after that, we'll have three days of just solid witnessing. And um, in the evenings, we'll have services. So not only... Um, did they go once? Actually, they had a couple of times where right after school, the school kids and school age children could go. And then uh, later, a little bit later towards, I think they even did some in the, the morning, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember now. But there's a couple of different times that they, they took people out and they're just, just going. And when we had the beginning service, <laughs> the very first one, it was electric. I mean, people were so expecting God to meet with us because for 10 days they've been praying and fasting and uh, and now they've been going out for these three solid days and we're going to have now these services and of course preach the gospel but as well preach to the believers and it was just uh, just electric and throughout the week we continued to see people saved and and uh, ones would come and trust Jesus Christ as Savior and and uh, not only there but also we see divine appointments where guys going and and leading someone to Christ then they're coming to the service and to one he said hey would you you know the next step is to be baptized he said okay uh when can i be baptized you can be baptized this sunday and he, he came uh, they were supposed to come on sunday morning but they ended up coming on sunday night of the the service and so here's an adult man he came he brought his girlfriend who's unsaved he brought his mom who's unsaved and another friend who just got out of prison probably unsaved and uh so he brought them and and they're a pretty rough group but they were there and uh, i gave the gospel and as i'm giving the gospel and i'm preaching uh then his uh, mom comes forward in the invitation his Girlfriend comes forward, and the other guy did not, and uh, they're coming forward, and counselors are talking to them and leading them to Christ right there, and and uh, now he's, we're waiting, you know, because it's taking a little bit longer, and, and uh, so uh, then he's getting back there, and he's getting ready to be baptized. Well, during this whole time, then uh, uh, they trust Christ as Savior, and they even, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, they're letting the, the, the church know that, and and so he's getting baptized, and then he's, the pastor said, you know what? You know, they came to see a baptism, and they got saved. 
they're adults. I'm just going to ask them if they want to be baptized, if they're understanding that baptism doesn't save them, that Jesus Christ did. And so he asked them, do you want to be baptized? Yeah. And so they had three baptisms that night. That was never happened before where someone comes from, to, to be able to see someone else saved. And that same night they're saved and baptized. And it was just an incredible thing. And then the next week I was already gone. And they had one of the little girls that trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. She, I don't know. Um, she would be elementary age, and she was saved, and she uh, had to get permission, and of course, to from her parents, they were not in the church, and they said, uh, uh, can she be baptized? And uh, she said, yes, and so the family came. Fourteen of them came, <laughs> and about seven of them trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. The next week, they had more people saved. Uh, they just kept continuing having people saved. During the revival meeting itself, we had 23 people trust Jesus Christ as Savior, as they continued on, they had over 30. You know, why is that? Because they are, by faith, taking God at his word and trusting him, but coming back to this fact, say that we need to pray for these things, and we need to ask that, you know what? God can do the same here. God can help you not only see people saved, but see them baptized, and see them discipled, and see them plugged into the church. God can do miraculous things. Notice in Acts 6 and verse 7, it says, And the word of God increased, and the numbers of the disciples multiplied. Not just added. There is adding, uh, but I love it. It's multiplied in verse 1, multiplied in verse 7. Uh, it goes from added in chapter 5, verse 14, to this multiplication. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's doing this work, and he's being poured out, and they're just trusting God. Would we trust God as well as, as we go into these meetings? You know, the, there's certain times I just just really can um, sense that the, the, the Spirit's working, but yet Satan's fighting. What do we need to do? We need to trust Him and pray uh, according to these things. Not only do we see we need to be full of faith, but secondly, we need to be full of power. We need to be full of power. Notice again, and Stephen was full of power, that is, being full of the Holy Ghost. In the passage of Scripture that we read earlier is Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, if you want to look there, again in verse 29, the Bible says, And now behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Oftentimes, this is exactly what we need. We need boldness to be able to speak and, and preach and give the gospel. And so, so here they are in context. They're, they're being threatened. They were just in prison. They're thrown out. So what are we going to do to them? And uh, you know, and what, what name and what power have you done this? We, we did it full of the Holy Ghost. And, and, uh, but they're, they're sending them out. But then they threaten them. Don't you dare teach or preach in the name of Jesus again. Well, this is a, this is a big deal. I mean... You could be captured, you could be beaten, imprisoned. You know, oftentimes their, their hands were locked in, their feet were in stocks, probably in a bent over situation, at least I would perhaps, I don't know, uncomfortable. I mean, just think of all of the difficulties of just having your hands and your feet there. And you know they're not gonna treat you nicely in the prisons. I mean, it was just, it would have been an absolutely terrible experience. It would have been true persecution. And so, what are they going to do? Have a prayer meeting <laughs> and say, God, would you behold their threatenings? We need your help. And we need, what does he say? Boldness. They're asking for boldness. Okay, now what does God give them? Ver look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, Acts 4.31, where they were assembled together and they were all, I love that, filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. They did get the boldness. But you know how they got the boldness? By being filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and that's the power and effectiveness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at the great grace in verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Every single one of them, every man, every lady, every Christian there, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had great power, great grace, and they had this great power as they gave witness of the resurrection. Do you have that power of the Holy Spirit? Are you seeing an effective witness? We just say, dear God, I'm ready to receive this power, to take by faith, 
Not only is it, I'm ready to be full of faith, I'm ready to be full of power, but then thirdly, I'm ready to be full of obedience. Now, it doesn't say obedience, but what was Stephen? Obedient. What was Philip? Obedient to the Spirit. When the Spirit said, go near, or go to the Gaza Strip, or whatever, he was, they were just simply obedient. Okay, now, would you watch with me for just a minute? What's, what we, can, we have to be careful of is this. It's like when I did it, flesh dependency and with the wrong motives, I was trying to be obedient. Now, doesn't that sound kind of like someone that's unsaved? I was trying to be good. (laughs) You know, in the Christian life, just like in our salvation, we are justified, declared righteous by Jesus Christ, by faith, because of faith. We trust him. And now he is our eternal life because we trust his his death, burial, resurrection. And our sanctification, sanctified by faith. It's his life, not mine, that's lived in me. When I'm experiencing revival, it's him, not me. And we need to be obedient. And so here's what we can do is we can invert the process and say, well, I'm just going to be faithful. I'm just going to go out there. I'm just going to be continue knocking the doors. I don't care if I'm uh, um, full of faith and full of power. I'm just out there doing it. No, 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 no. What that is, that's wood, hay, and stubble. When you do it on your own, and we try to invert this whole process, just be obedient, and maybe later this other things will happen. You know what? We need to be full of faith and say, Dear God, I believe the gospel's ready, the harvest is ready, the, um, uh, certainly the Holy Spirit's ready, but I'm ready now. And now I'm ready to be full of faith, full of power. And as a result, again, the obedience comes more easily because at this point we're yielded and we're full of boldness. So here I was, um, I was in a revival conference and uh, I needed to, to study. And so I didn't have my own son's coffee. And so I had to go to a coffee shop. And so I knew tomorrow morning, I'm going to a coffee shop. I'm going to study there. So I said, dear God, would you help someone to be saved at the coffee shop? It's just my prayer. Lord, help me witness to someone to help them to be saved. So I took a whole bunch of tracks. I had a DVD at the time. We ran out of these and we're just going to do online now. But uh, we had gospel DVDs that we did. And um, and I see someone come in. I get in conversation. I give them the track, but I couldn't get to the gospel. I'd see someone else, hey, would you take a gift? Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, one, two, three. I'm like, no, it's like 10, 11, 12 people. I'm there. And still, there was just no open door to get to the gospel. And um, and I left. You know, Lord, I, I really thought maybe someone would be saved at the coffee shop. And uh, so then I went to... Um, out to eat with uh, another evangelist, and he took me to Cracker Barrel. And so we went to Cracker Barrel. And I, I had a couple of tracks left, and, and I'm handing those out, and I'm done. And I had one DVD left. And uh, we ate, and after we ate, I'm walking out the door, and we're going out to the parking lot, and I see the guy, another guy, he has a jacket on, but underneath he has a little blue collar of the, the Cracker Barrel. You know Cracker Barrel? Uh, the Cracker Barrel uh, shirt. And I said, hey, did you just get off work? He said, no. So he said, I just came in to see if I was supposed to work. I thought, well, I wondered why didn't he just call. But, and I said, okay. And so he, he's walking out. And so I'm thinking, maybe he came in just so I could witness to him. <laughs> so I said, hey, uh, can I give you a DVD? And uh, it talks about how to go to heaven and it explains it from the Bible. Oh, okay. I say, you know, there's two misconceptions that people have about going to heaven. First is they think that you have to be really good to be there. And then secondly, they think that you can't know ahead of time. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, you have to be really good to be there. I said, okay, got him. (laughs) I said, well, you know what? What if the Bible said something differently than what you think? I showed him Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He goes, oh, I guess maybe that, that is a little different. And I started going through the gospel his name's Gary. He's in, the, in his 20s. He's in the Flint area, Detroit somewhat area of, of Michigan. And I got to Jesus Christ dying on the cross. I said, Gary, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? And he had no idea. 
20-something years of age. He had attended some churches, apparently didn't preach the gospel at all because he didn't even know why Jesus died on the cross. And it took a, quite a long time with him to explain that and explain the, the substitution of Christ on our behalf. And it's, it's not us doing good works. And, and, uh, and so I went through and finally, like 50 minutes, an hour later, he bows his head and he trusts Christ as Savior in the Cracker Barrel parking lot. <laughs> Amen. Now, the whole time, though, I was focused in on the coffee shop. But God wanted me to witness to someone at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> you see, here's the thing I took away from this. It's two. You know, first of all, you know, I look back, I thought every single person I talked to at the coffee shop took the track or took the DVD. And I would not have done that as much, maybe one or two, maybe the worker, but that's about it. But I wouldn't have done that as much unless I was be praying and I was looking for the one that was right to harvest and God, would you lead someone? And I, that's one takeaway. But another was this. God was getting me ready at the coffee shop so someone at Cracker Barrel could be saved. You see, here's how we look at the power of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes we say, well, where's the light switch in the room? Let's just flip it on. We're going soul winning. We're going knocking doors. Okay, let's flip it on. Boop. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need your power right now. Okay, all right, we're done with the soul winning. All right, click. You know, the Holy Spirit's not a power. He's not just an influence. He's a person. And he lives inside you every day. How often do you do, do you even recognize the Holy Spirit's presence. <laughs> How often do you talk to him? It's okay to. How often do you just relate to him? You know, God, this whole time, wants a relationship with you, and so often we just want to flip on, flip off. And God's saying, you know what? I'll give you the outflow of fruit, the fruit of souls being saved, is just an outflow of his life in you as we're rightly related and abiding in him and full of him and his spirit we need to be full of full of power and full of obedience one last story and i'm finished i was at that same conference and we were ending the conference and about that time um i remember i was staying at a hotel and and I was getting out of the car, and I had just kind of this dark feeling, kind of like tonight. It's it's a, it's the last night, and so I just had this this thought, and it was, it's all over. Like um, you know, it's not going to continue. Like God's not going to keep blessing or something. And I said, no, I'm I'm dismissed. That's not from God. That's from Satan. And I said, no, that's not true. And I said, I remember saying out loud, all by myself. I said, it's not over. <laughs> I get out of the car, and instead of going to the front door of the hotel, I go into the side door. When I went to the side door, I saw a guy out there, and he's sitting in his shorts, and he's having a smoke. And I said, so it's I said, pretty comfortable night, isn't it? He said, well, it's actually a little chilly for me. I said, really? It's, it's really nice out, kind of like tonight. And uh, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Key West. We're up in Michigan. I'm like, what are you doing up in Michigan from Key West, Florida? And uh, he goes, oh, I, I've got a family up here, and my daughter's graduating. I came up, and I'm, I'm going through some problems. And he just started to open up and just dump on me. And I told him, I said, Rob, I don't think this conversation is by accident. And he looked at me and his eyes got wide. And he goes, I don't either. I thought that as soon as you walked up. And I, see, I said, you know, what you need to help you with your problems is to know God is your help and God's in your life. And do you even know if you died, if you go to heaven? He goes, oh, yeah, I think so. I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, he said it this way. I hang my hat on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> we started going through some of the Ten Commandments. He goes, oh, I guess I don't do those <laughs> as much as I thought. And, you know, then I, I went through the gospel, and I showed him Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And, and I always love to, if I can, as much as possible, to show them the Word of God. And, and for that night, it, it was dark, and so I had to use the, the iPad. And so... And uh, so I said, hey, look at it here. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I handed him the iPad, and he's reading it. And he's reading on his own. He says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. And he stops, and he looks up and goes, that's what I'm doing, isn't it? It's myself. 
was like, I didn't say it. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit starts to reveal this. He goes, and I said, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I said, what you need to do, Rob, is to place your faith alone in Jesus alone to save you. And I explained it you know, kind of like a, someone drowning. They call out for help for the lifeguard to save them. And I'm talking, he still has the iPad in his hand. And all of a sudden, he just hands it back to me. I'm like, is he at this point going to reject? He doesn't. He says, he hands it back. He said, Chris, just tell me what to do. <laughs> I said, well, just trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Tell him, you can tell him in a prayer. And he does. And, and he, he's saved. I looked at him again after he's saved. I said, Rob, I said, I don't, this wasn't by accident at all. He said, that's more true than you know. What do you mean? Let me read you an email. And I have it right here. He sent this email that afternoon to an independent Baptist pastor about an hour or so away in that area because he's going through problems. He said, good afternoon. My name is Rob, and I was hoping to connect with you, seeking some guidance and much-needed prayer. Help. Strive to be seems so far out of reach for me lately. I'm not sure what happened or where to start in writing myself. I've, I've had some eye-opening experience. Um, I don't have the right image, and it goes through, and, and it goes through some specific problems. And he says, I come to you somewhat broken. <laughs> I want to be a better man. I'm not sure if you're willing to help. I'm not sure where to start, but I figure this email would be a first, good first step. So the pastor gets the email and he replies. He said, I can't meet with you right now, but your hotel is literally three minutes from a conference from a church that can't help you. That was our conference. He said, go there at seven o'clock and they'll help you from the Bible. They'll pray with you. They'll, they'll, get you through these things and they'll show you what, what you need. And so he said, okay, I'm going to do that. Well, he, Rob lays down to take a nap. And he falls asleep and he sleeps all the way through the service. And he gets up, it's dark. He goes, oh man, I just blew it. I needed help. I'm at my wit's end. <sighs> what am I going to do now? And he goes outside of the hotel. And he lights up his cigarette to have a smoke. Right about that time, an evangelist is getting out of his car saying, it's not over. <laughs> we, I tell you, we met for breakfast the next morning. We stayed in contact. He's at, he asked me for um, a church in the area. and It's incredible to see how many people are out there like Rob that are ready, looking, searching. The question is, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready to say, I'm I want to be full of faith, Lord. I want to be full of power. I take, I receive your power, your Holy Spirit. And I want to be full of obedience. As you, you just tell me to do something, I'll do it. And I'll be yielded to your spirit.